here. The island of Samosir lies in the Toba Lake in North Sumatra, the west and south. Ascend gradually into a hill district, then changes suddenly into a high plateau, which rises on the east like on the east side to a height of one 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 thousand eight hundred meters, sloping abruptly into the Toba Lake. In the center is a wide, barren hill. The region is strangely fantastic, picked by state world narrow gorges. Here flow numerous num numerous rivers, of which the larger springs from the western cliff. There are no actual mountain peaks. The island has no forest, with the result that in the rainy season the little rivers change within a few hours into mighty floods, which are very destructive. In the dark ages, volcanoes perch for the molten lava over Samosi. On all sides, all colossal masses of cliff and boulders scattered over hills and dust as by a giant's, head, a giant's hand. From this material, the inhabitants of the island have wrought beautiful things, high stone ramparts with, with round and square corner towers and bastions, planted with dense tickets from tons from ton of ton bamboo so that no enemy, no enemy might venture to force their way into the little villages. Only two sides have small gates which are closed at night by a complicated sort of gate. Then the hood sleeps in the solitude like some ancient town in medieval Europe. Everywhere are scattered the pic picturesque forlorn ruins of these old forts often high and inaccessible of the cliffs darkly outlined against the clear starry sky. Forsaken eagles nest, deeply tragic, consisting sometimes merely of a high round tower. These artistic, beautifully constructed walls are the first objects to attract the attention of the scientific explorer whose wanderings began on this remarkable island. Nowhere in the East Archipelago have structures in stone being rock with so much artistic beauty, beauty and architectural skill. The village green is divided into two halves. On one side are the houses, on the other side the gas granaries, both constructed on separate stone terraces. In front of the houses are rice trees of, of stone nearly hewn, sometimes beautifully ornamented, so that they are veritable works of art. It is worthy of note that these rice blocks are set on a place of four or five or five other stones and thus form a sort of dolmen. Sometimes next to the rice block, a flat stone lies on a number of boulders forming a real dolmen. Similar slabs are found at Limbong on the south slope of the volcano Pusuk Buhin. They are placed in the circle and serve as seats for, for the heathen village ships Bagbaringins. It is of course impossible to determine whether the seats are the remains of the prehistoric culture, but even if this is not the case, they are not they are nonetheless remarkable. For they reveal the fact that those who made these monuments were inspired by an old and edge old thought. Indeed, the entire Batak art of plastic stone is permitted with an ancient tradition. Interesting is a domain in Limbong which serves as receptacle for the head and hoofs of a cargo slaughtered every year at the beginning of the rice planting. The blood of the sacrifice is supposed to encourage the cut of the crop. We see here the same relation between cargo, megaliths and rice as in all the stone cults of Southeast Asia. The people of Limbong no longer know how old are these monuments, since Bataks usually know precisely how many generations ago a monument was founded, at least 10 generations or about 500 years. There can be no doubt that these memorials are the most ancient in the Batak lands. I estimate them to be about to be to be about 1,000 years old 
but it is quite possible that they are still older going back to the beginning of our era. Perhaps they were even constructed by the Bata's ancestors who, according to a generally accepted tradition, were settled in Limbong. Samosir lies in the midst of, Bata, of the Bata country. The principal Bata tribes live, live around the lake on the south side the Tobas, on the east of Timbux, on the north of Karos, and on the west of Paks. All this regard Sa Samosir as their homeland, and it may be and it may therefore be so missed that this island contains all sorts of ancient relics of the greatest interest to the study of Bataks. The climate is agreeable, probably due to the fast expanse of water which slowly absorbs and then radiates the heat. The humidity is light, no wonder the oldest Batak tribes settled in this, in this region. This shift, their shift means of subsistence are agriculture, cattle raising and fishing. The sea farming product, product is rice, which is planted on dry as well as on irrigated fields. During recent years, during, year, during, recent years, during recent years, large crops of onions and other vegetables have been planted, which thrive which, which very well, forming an important source of income. Most of the cattle belong to the native chiefs, since the common people cannot pay for them. Many of the natives earn their living by fishing everywhere in the village near the lake nets are bait, bought from yacht, bought from onions and for sale. Weaving also an important industry and is, fa in, and is a favorite occupation for women and girls. Formerly, the people spun their own yarn. Women staffs are traded in all the markets. The making of pottery is also important. The chief districts Margas are Sumbas and Lotung, respectively in the north and in the south. The Marga is a genealogical unit and owns the of the ground. Formerly, there were three castes. The Raja, consisting of the village founder and his descendants in the male line. The Rai, consisting of free and prominent citizens Burunabolon, the latter of whom were married to the Raja's daughters and could in turn become, become Rajas in case they founded a new village while this was not possible for the ordinary Rai and the Hatoban or slave caste. Very interesting also was the information collected concerning a jointed doll which is made to dance at the feast of the dead at Samosir and on the south shore of the Toba Lake the name Sigale Gale is used for an almost life size wooden doll with jointed limbs. It is mounted on a long chest with wheels. In front of her is a little doll which with folded hands which are raised in salute when the last doll dance. The construction of this figure takes about four months. When the child dies of some important Raja dies childless, her headless doll is made on which is placed the skull of the decrease. The face is thin yellow with the yolk of an egg and is the eye sockets are placed scarlet fruits of eyes of metal. In case the skull is broken, a wooden head is made. The dead man's soul now descends into the doll, who is laid by an explicator, his head worn in the turban. The bystanders now also begin to dance and to present the doll with the money, siri, and cigarettes, all of which the Tukang Mijan puts into his pocket. The dancing is intended to placate the spirit of the, depart of the departed. An old woman sings of his pictures. The doll rides about the, on the chest, embracing friends and relatives. The eyelids are more feeble, and since there is a more sponge, in the head of the image can even weep. The dancing of this doll in the moonlight is an imposing spectacle, with making an indelible impression on all observers. The feature is this in costly garments and works of house a house hair wig, also beautiful head, kerchief and breast earrings. The skull of either a man or a woman may be set on the body 
on which may be virtually discerned by the curves of a woman's breast. Formerly, there were even those with heads on which was near a human skin. These dolls could move their eyeballs and put on their tongue. Here is the legend of Siga Legalis origin. Once upon a time, there was a man named Datu Pangana Sklapchak, who went into the forest. There he saw a tree, tall as a man, and without leaves or branches. As one made an image of that, of that tree, it would be something precious, she thought. And so it happened that he carved the tree into the form of a woman. Now it chanced that Bao 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 Pak Tiga Tiga, a dealer in garments, beds, and golden ornaments, also came that way. He saw the image, and it occurred to him that he might dress and adorn it. He therefore put some garments on it, put rings in its ears, and then he saw that it was very beautiful. So fair indeed that he could hardly take himself away. When evening came and he wished to return to the village, he tried to remove the garments and the jewels, but he could not. They were attached to the image. He wept over his loss, but was finally compelled to leave his poverty behind. Next, there came Datu Park Tawar, the healer, who had a medicine which would prolong life, raise the dead, and even recall the spirits of the of bodies which had already gone into the solutions. When he saw the image, he was such a mess, a, a mess at, at its beauty, and he therefore conceived the idea of using his magic potion on it. He did so, the image came to life and became a human being whom he brought back to the village. The wife of Datu Park Tawar received her with joy and adopted her as her own daughter. She called her Nai Mangale. When market day came, they brought Nai Mangale in solemn procession to the marketplace, playing the drums, meanwhile to announce to one and all that they had adopted her as their daughter. Nai Mangale danced in the market, in the marketplace, and all who saw her swayed in rhythm with her beautiful cadence. When the market people had returned home, the news of what had happened reached the sculpture and the theater. They went to the healer, and each of them laid claim to Nai Mangale. She is my daughter, for I carved her image, said the sculpture. She is my daughter, for I clothed her and gave her jewels, said the theater. She is my daughter, for I called her to life, said the healer. As they could not see, as they could not come to any agreement, they began to shoot at each other. The healer fought against the other two, but as each had just claimed, no one was victorious and no one lost. Even the rajas could see no way of setting the dispute. At last, the problem was submitted to a man named Siaji Bahir Bahir, the half-man. He was asked to solve it and proposed the following. The healer should be considered as her father and should have the right to give her hand in marriage. The trader should be her brother and as, and as such would receive her share of the dowry. The sculpture should be her maternal uncle and would receive an uncle's share. The Rajas and all the parties concerned agreed to this arrangement. A certain Datu Paktiktik, who lived to the southwest, asked for the hand of Nai Mangali, but she, would, but she would have nothing to do with him, because he was not as fair as she. Then he put a magic spell upon her, so that she finally consented to marry him. But though they were married for a long time, they had no children, and at last Nai Mangale became ill and died. During her illness, she had told her husband that he must have Datu Mangana, 
make a life size image of her to call it Sigale Gale and to have a dick plate before it. If this were not done, the spirit of Nai Mangale would not be admitted to the abode of the dead. She would find no rest and would therefore be compelled to cook Datu Paktiktik so that she would, not ha she would have no sons and daughters. Datu Paktiktik did as his wife told him. For this reason, a Sigale Gale is always made for one who has died childless so that the spirit of the dead may have no harmful influence. This dancing ceremony is called that Papupuk Sepata, the dispersing of a curse. It is difficult to form a clear and complete idea of the position occupied by the Sigale Gale in the Bata community. It was probably brought to Samosik by Megalith builders. It is now that formerly it danced by the great stone sarcophagus, indeed, that several doors with the scars of ancestors were made to perform around the coffin. We are concerned here with a scientific problem of unusual interest. In an aesthetic sense, also, Sigale Gale has a place of honor. No one who has seen her dancing and weeping in the green mist of Samosi in the night field with stars and silence will ever forget her. Thought of love and immortality surround her. The spirits of the dead are safe in her keeping, raised above every delusion. I have previously mentioned the stone of the stone sarcophagus. The existence of these monuments has been known for many years, but no one has ever taken the trouble to study them. The task of our expedition was to carefully study and photograph all stone coffins. In this way, we were able to bring to light a megalith cult heated to and most entirely unknown with, un with the most interesting ceremonies and feasts. On the fourth side, these coffins have a great monster head. They all lie to, on the coast, the face turn long, landward. As a rule, the figure of a man crouches under the monster head on the opposite side. It is the, is the figure of a woman. Occasionally, these figures can change places. The woman's head is nearly always made of a stone differing from that of the coffin. Sometimes, she carries a small bowl for holy water. In her hands, she holds a mortar. The, monsters, the monster head has large round eyes and three horns carved backwards. On the neck is a rough pointed upstanding bristles. The middle horn frequently had a long oblique curved point with an ornament. In two cases, this consisted of Carbo's head. This was an ancient head dress of the Bata ships and is still found quite often in a different form in the images of Nias. The coffin. The coffin stand either in the village of our side sometimes on a foundation of stone of stones sometimes merely resting on the earth in the latter case a good the good part of the govin is sunk into the ground they are painted with floral motifs the usual colors being red white and blackish blue these coffins serve as a resting place for the skulls of the dead the head is are first buried in the ground a year later a year later, they are dug up with festive ceremonies are placed in the coffin. The cover consists of several pieces which can be lifted without difficulty. Whenever a raja, whenever a raja wishes to have a coffin made, he summons a sculpture. The latter needs at least ten helpers and delivers the coffin in about two months. When the work is begun, a cow is slaughtered and the sculpture offers a prayer. His tools are a hammer and chisel, a cobalt and an axe. Far away in the mountains, a suitable stone is chosen. It is hacked roughly into shape and placed on a wooden sledge with rollers. This hun then hundreds of natives drag it, drag it down to the plains, a task which often taken, ta takes months. Everyone is glad to have for the Raja, 
for the Raja gives them food and has a cow slaughtered every day. At back of the at back of the coffin sits a Hassan Daran, an old man or woman, in whom in whom the spirit of the dead has descended. It is though that the that the Hassan Daran made the stone like by sitting upon it. She cries continually, pull. While now and then she performs a magic dance. Arrived in the village, the coffin is completed. The sculptures, the sculpture obtains as rewarded cargoes, two golden earrings and twenty Spanish doublons. Generally, the coffin has only one hollow, but at Hutagi Jang, on the west shore of the Ta- of Toba Lake, there is a coffin with two chambers. In the foremost are kept the skulls of the rajas. In the rear, do- in the rear, those of the family at Sipira. In the mountains of South Samosir, we found a costly Chinese plate of green porcelain. On this, on this lay the scars of a man of a woman, covered by plate and the same material with a floral decoration. Formerly, the skull well dyed, re, well dyed red with siri. From time to time, they were removed from the grave and dances were performed with them in the light of the moon. Meat and palm wine were put into the moths, the living spoke to the dead and were over, uh, over them. These impressive ceremonies serve as a memorial to the dead. The skulls were also kept in tremendous urns, of which thirteen were found. One is hewn from the cliff and remains attached to it. Occasionally, there is a seated human figure on the top with the sunset over its head a human figure is carved on the uh, on the side wall. This orange differ special in the covers, of which we distinguish two types: concave and convex. The concave line may be short or long. In the latter case, a pointed cover is formed, sometimes crowned with a receptacle for holy water. On coffins at Lumban Raja, Naibaho, Hapotan. Simbolon, Nainggolan, Sipinggan, Hutarihit, Panguruan Banjir Pasir, Gorat, Hutaraja, Sidulul, Hutahotang, Sipira, Hutagugu, Tomok, Simanindo, Simarmata, Binangaborta, and Lumban Suhisuri, Arns, were discovered at Panguruan, Pancur, Hutabolon, Lumban Julu, Gorat, Tolping, and Simanindo. The coffin at Lumban Raja has a remarkable feature. Under the monster head is the figure of a standing man. The coffins of Panchur are the largest on the island. In the coffin at Siriaun, we found eight skulls. The one at Panguluan Banjak Pasir is badly mutilated. The urn at Gorat is not sculptured in one piece, but built up with rings of stone. It contains not only skulls but also bones. As we have already said, we found at Sipira a coffin with skulls and Chinese plates. It is a remarkable fact in itself to find a coffin of this kind not on the coast but in the interior. It was surrounded by a stone house. The coffin has a fluid at both ends. Instead of instead of a monster head, under the rubbish of the room lay a wooden cover with a triangular section. The skulls between two plates had belonged to a certain Panaharan and his wife. While the other while the other five skulls did not lie on plates, no one could explain. Probably became their head belonged to people on of lesser rank. These plates are called Pasut are called Pasu and are very valuable. Now far from here is a love hill from which protrude the fragments of at least three coffins. Sipira lies high in the mountains, a few kilometers beyond on the coast, standing a number of pillars in rectangle four times four times twelve meters. The two on the west side have a sculpture ox head. 
Formerly, there was a roof over these pillars, and the board of a prominent Raja was kept there. In the neighborhood are other pillars too. Farther north, near Tomok, lies a group of no less than eight coffins on a low hill. They lie N E S W. The largest coffin contains the skeletons of a man and a woman, thus not the skulls of an entire family. Next to this coffin lies a smaller one, almost entirely sunk into the ground. Immediately behind the monster head sits a human figure with the right hand held over the breast. All those coffins has, have a cover with a triangular, triangular section. They are shaded by mighty trees. Simanindo has many remarkable sites, among others a shrine facing to the west, with a stone image on its roof. Close by are a sarcophagus and an urn, both hewn from the natural rock. By the lake shore stands an over stone chest, in which is kept indigo to dye the yarns used in weaving. The village has horses with magnificent carvings, beautifully colored. The gables terminate in a, in a high red peak and are, and are adorned with buffalo heads. In one of the horses is kept a very beautiful wooden image of a woman with hands folded over the breast and a long pillar on the head. It represents a certain Shiboru Saragi. At Simar Mata, on the north coast, stands a rough coffin on the shore. Cover and contents have disappeared. The last stone is simply hollowed out to the hollowed out to serve as a coffin. It is remarkable that besides some most antiquities also found on the shore of the Lake Tuba, our explorations in these fields brought to the light of the following. On the southwest shore at, at Park Sirangguran stands a magnificent stone sarcophagus at the rear end. At the rear end sits the figure of a woman with a wall on her head. The great monster had a gentle, inquisitive smile and an expression of deep resignation. This image is one of the greatest and noblest works of art ever produced in Sumatra. Under the image sits the figure of a man with knees drawn up and a fillet of flowers on the head, nose and upper lip have apparently been been restored at a later date. Traces of red and blue paint are still plainly visible. The stone has been brought from a place lying three kilometer three kilometer to the north. The transport the transport taking three days. In the vicinity stands the largest and the most beautiful urn in the Bata country, crowned by city human feature. A few kilometers farther east, at Huta Pulo Pulo, lies a second coffin. At back sits not a woman, but a man with armlets and a hat on his head. Inside the head and the top of the head is a deep hollow, probably used for a magic potion, which was poured into, a, into the image to give it a soul. A highly unique and remarkable sarcophagus is found at Aixig Aik Gudang. It is not only ornamented with the head and tail of a monster animal, but even has feet. Besides the features at both ends, there is a third in the middle of the coffin. Formerly, the monument stood under a roof on the pillars where hung the jawbones of pigs, which has been slaughtered when the shrine was built. Far to the south, at Tangana Godang Tarutung, lies a sarcophagus of an entirely different type. On the foreside is a large human face and a very small body with arms. It is the sarcophagus farther south in the Bata country and I owe it and I owe its discovery to Dr. G. H. Mas Maslan. Let us, however, return to the west shore of the Lake Toba. Lumban Pangalawan is a lovely village surrounded by high walls and bastions covered with bamboo. On the village green sands, a remarkably beautiful, a remarkably beautiful coffin. 
on the foundation of good stones. Here also are something are some artistic rice thoughts. As Ilalahi lie an unfinished coffin and an arm. Strangely enough, the coffin still contains skulls. Father thought at Huta Ginjang, we found a coffin with two chambers. In the foremost, we kept the skulls of prominent chiefs. In the rear doors of the families, the monster head is pointed and adorned with an ox head. On the south east of the leg to of the leg, there are also various antiquities, for instance at Lumban Rang Porsea. Here and decorate here are decorated pillars. And on the top of the coffin, to the left and the right of the four side are small ledges, which formerly contain images. But the coffin stands a square on with pyramid shape, cover also a short broad pillar which formerly served as the base of an image. In the urn lies the skulls with a certain Opu Boliton and his son Parihuluan. In the coffin lie the bones of the five sons of Parihuluan. In the coffin also lies, lie gongs, drums and oboes, so that the dead may make music in the health after. As we know, the Daya of Borneo also give musical instruments to their dead. At Lumban Nabolon lies a coffin with a cover in one piece. At Huta Bagasan lie two, of which one has a, one has ha a head, on which is a bamboo with horse hair. Under the head is a large face. The last four coffins differ from those at Samosi in that the monster head is not broad but pointed. At Balige, in front of a house, stands a beautifully decorated coffin which has not yet been hollowed up. Followed out. Further to the east are found coffins and urns of a different kind, which have which have been described this year by Dr. P. Forhover and G. L. T. Kalman. We also made a study of the pros in the Toba Lake. Some have a figure head in the in the form of a bird, a buffalo, or a horse. In many houses, the dead are buried in the in the pro with the head of a hornbill. Similar words are represented on a bronze on bronze drums in Tonkin. In the fifth century BC, on this do, on these drums on these drums are also depicted houses in the Bata style of architecture.